Good evening to everyone who's joining us for today's webinar. I'm Rebecca Vieira, coordinator of the Inter-American Teacher Education Network, also known as I-10, which is an initiative of the Organization of American States out of the Department of Human Development, Education, and Employment. Before we begin, I'd briefly like to introduce you to I-10 for those who don't yet know us. The purpose of I-10 is to contribute to the improvement of quality and equitable education through teacher education across the Americas. To that end, we offer funds and activities for educational leaders to work towards the objective of resolving matters of policy and practice as they relate to STEM teacher education. STEM represents science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and also their integration. To learn more about us, please visit our website, which will be listed at the end of tonight's webinar. Presented by teacher fellows, project team members, and other network supporters, this webinar series aims to support teachers under quarantine in particular. This evening, we're very pleased to have with us um, Dr. Padu Seshire, uh, who will be presenting from George Mason University in the state of Virginia in the United States of America. His presentation will last approximately one hour, followed by a question and answer session. If you do have questions, we encourage you to please use the Q&A tool, which is in, um, which you'll find somewhere near the top of your screen. Um, if you type it in the chat, it's possible that it won't be seen. Whereas if you put it in the Q&A, we will be monitoring those and we will respond to as many as possible at the end of tonight's presentation. Please do note that this webinar will be recorded. It will also be posted on the website, um, which will be shared at the end of this presentation along with PDF of all of the presentation slides for those who might like to go back and see the resources. And finally, at the end of the presentation, you'll be sent to a survey. Please complete that as it gives us some sense of the benefit of these webinars and also what you might like to um, learn about in the future. So again, thank you so much for your attendance. And at this point, I'm going to go ahead and hand over um, the control to uh, Dr. Padu. Thank you very much, uh, Rebecca, uh, for the introduction. And uh, it's obviously uh, wonderful to see so many, uh, so many people from so many different countries. So let me go ahead and uh, share my screen. And let me actually full screen it. Okay. And I will also prepare to have the chat. Uh, and then I will go ahead and start. So Thank you. Well, greetings, everyone. Uh, my name is Padu, and uh, I'm from George Mason University and uh, uh, in Virginia, uh, in the United States. And uh, I see so many different countries, uh, uh, Ecuador, Belize, uh, uh, Jamaica, uh, uh, Bahamas, uh, Grenada. So it's wonderful. Philippines. So, uh, and Suriname, of course. Uh, so I, I, it's, it's wonderful to see all of you. Uh, and we are going to have a lot of uh, interesting exchange today uh, on, on pedagogical practices and, uh, and in application to COVID all as well. So, but my main goal is to actually share with you as many uh, pedagogical practices that can be used uh, uh, to engage students uh, uh, in STEM, science, technology, engineering, mathematics. So let me uh, go ahead here. Okay. So uh, I will have this contact later, much later uh, towards the end. But uh, if you uh, want to take down anything or take a picture or whatever it is, so, uh, so that uh, you want to get in touch with me later on, uh, and ask questions, you're totally welcome to do that. And I'll flash this slide one more time later on. So uh, I've been a faculty uh, for uh, quite some time. Uh, uh, I graduated uh, with my PhD in 1998. And uh, ever since, uh, I've been in the education workforce uh, and, uh, you know, and trying to do what I enjoy doing. And uh, so, which is essentially education for all. And what that means is, is to not only interact with multiple different types of uh, uh, learning frameworks, students, uh, diverse populations, uh, you know, and, uh, and I learn a lot every time I engage with uh, uh, different groups of people and uh, trying to both share and also learn a lot of uh, 
information on how to enhance my own pedagogical practices. So I'm I'm here to share with you for the next one hour, uh, you know, things that I've learned and uh, you know some things that will be very useful even in situations uh, like uh, we are in right now. How can we take advantage of these pedagogical practices uh, when we are teaching and uh, engaging more and more students? So on the top left of this uh, slide, uh, you're seeing a student actually uh, write on the board. And that's one of the most important learning frameworks that I'll present later on, which is called active learning. So today you're gonna to hear more than 20 different frameworks and uh, maybe one or two will appeal to you immediately and you may be able to use it in the classroom. So what you're seeing there is actually a student actually at the board rather than the teacher at the board. And I'm just the teacher that is standing next to her and watching what she's doing. And she's one of the many students in that classroom that is actually writing on the walls. And this practice is actually called active learning, where uh, students demonstrate their understanding on uh, the board publicly. So everybody gets to see everybody else's work. But, uh, you know, uh, it is about the uh, teacher as a facilitator trying to make, say, make sense for the students uh, what uh, the representations on the board or the writings on the board, why they make sense to each other and how do you connect those things. And that's where the teacher uh, plays an important role. So this act of bringing students uh, in the conversation and teaching is, is a way to do active learning. Right after that, uh, on the top, you see another group of students I enjoy working with. These are uh, 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 people that uh, uh, serve in the military. Uh, they bring completely different expertise from the field. And so they really teach educators a lot in terms of the real world problems. And uh, it's definitely fun to actually both hear, uh, you know, the types of problems that they deal with and how we can use what we know to solve those problems. And then uh, to the right on the top, you, uh, you know, another group of students that I work with uh, on research. These are graduate students, undergraduate students, high school students working on research. Uh, on the right, the second picture, the middle picture is a group I enjoy working with, teachers. Uh, teachers from all across the world. And uh, that's actually a summer professional development uh, uh, that we hosted at George Mason University. And uh, down below is Senator Mark Warner from Virginia, uh, and how we uh, were able to actually work on a research project with the student and uh, how it made all the way to the White House. And we got a chance to meet uh, Senator Mark Warner, and I'll tell you later on when I get a chance. And then uh, in the bottom, uh, in the middle, you see actually uh, a program that I enjoy uh, coordinating with my colleagues. It's called FOCUS. Females of color underrepresented in STEM. So uh, to actually reach out to, and uh, you know, STEM is for everybody. So in terms of uh, uh, the inequity that that we see in terms of uh, uh, you know number of women in STEM, uh, you know number of underrepresented minorities in STEM. So what can we actually do? So this is a special program created, which I run during the summer, and we bring about hundred girls to campus, and they engage in. Uh, uh, in uh, uh, lots and lots of uh, activities uh, around STEM. And then of course, uh, uh, the picture at the bottom on the left, you're seeing teachers inside the classroom as students. So the teachers are engaged as students and engaged in activities that are brand new to them. And, uh, and I believe in, uh, you know, uh, that gives the experience for the teachers to be in the students' shoes and understand what it takes to really master a topic. And then uh, above that is a country that I see a lot of people are typing that you're from Suriname. That's one of my favorite countries there. So, you know, it's actually a school uh, that I've visited several times and uh, excited teacher there raising, their, uh, raising her hand with the lots of kids that are engaged in a program that I'll talk about in just a second. So uh, the goal today is to, uh, you know, if I can request you to, uh, if you're a teacher and this conference uh, or this uh, talk today, I'm assuming to I'm talking to lots and lots of teachers, educators, uh, I'd like you to uh, take your teacher hat off for the next one hour with me. Let me be the teacher and you can be the student. So you can enjoy the learning that uh, will happen in the next one hour. So first thing that we want to understand is as a teacher, 
uh, you know, just besides teaching, we do so many other different things. So for example, we have to be a resource uh, person. You know, that means we have to know our students very well. We also have to coordinate and manage uh, what we do, uh, you know, every single day. So we facilitate discussions, facilitate classroom work, facilitate a lot of things, right? And, and then we have to be a friend and counselor to the students, you know, so, um, so treat them as peers. And then, of course, we also uh, have to wear the hat of an evaluator, right? So, and, uh, and then, uh, you know, the students are always, well, you know, wanting to model after you. So, you know, we have to be prepared to be that role model. So as a teacher, we all go beyond just that one word of teaching, okay? So we do so many other things. And, uh, and I think that's, that's why, you know, uh, teachers must be put on a pedestal so in terms of uh, how much they offer, uh, you know, uh, and all the support that is, uh, uh, that is actually, uh, uh, you know, uh, that's provided. And uh, uh, I understand that uh, this will be actually translated to YouTube and then you will be able to use captions and uh, see it in different languages as well, okay? So uh, my talk is gonna be a, a lot of, uh, you know, uh, you guys engaging. So what I want you to do is to think, talk and reflect. And what I mean by that is the following. In the next slide, I'm going to actually ask you a question. Now, I don't want you to type it in the chat box because my goal is to teach you some, some tools, strategies, learning frameworks that you can take back with you. So I'm gonna introduce you to the first tool today, okay? Now, what I want you to do is the following. Read the question that I have on the screen and I'll read it for you. What are some of the effective pedagogical strategies for engaging students? In other words, how do you engage students? And I don't want a big, essay just a word or a phrase that you think is very important what i want you to do is not type it on the chat box but i want you to go to that website that you see i will read it for you p o l l e v dot com slash p s e s h a i y e r 217 i will wait for a second and uh, rebecca has posted it there so you're welcome to just cut and paste it and all I want you to do is type words that come to your mind or how you practice uh, on uh, once you have a box that will open up and start typing things into that box, okay? I will wait for a couple of uh, uh, maybe about 20 seconds and then I'll minimize the screen. I would like you to, uh, if you don't know this tool, it's a wonderful tool, I'll tell you why. So once again, pollev.com slash my first initial, last name, 217, as Rebecca has typed it. Okay, and when you go, uh, when you type it, you're gonna get a box and you just need to type the word inside, okay? Now I'm gonna minimize my screen for a second. I'm going to maximize another screen. I'm so happy that you guys are all typing stuff really, really well. You see what's going on. Whatever you are typing is appearing on the screen as a word cloud. And it's amazing that learning seems to be something very important. I see inquiry based, I see puzzles, I see interactive, I see games, uh, you know, uh, it's amazing. Uh, how many things that you're all typing. Isn't it fantastic that it is input from so many people from so many parts of the world, right on the screen, real time. Now imagine if you were to walk into the class and you were going to teach uh, a subject in mathematics, let's say probability, I'm just making up a topic. How cool it would be if you actually ask the students what they already know. By the way, this activity is what I call as a pre-assessment. I am judging what you guys know as a teacher. So I can teach my class, the rest of the class, based on what the responses are already there. So that's where the art of the teacher comes, this to go into the classroom and not immediately start teaching, but actually judge what the students already know in the content that you're going to teach, and then bring that in the, into the lesson that you're going to teach. So it's wonderful drama. Now, of course, I'm using a free software. The software is called Poll Everywhere, okay? So once again, I, if you don't know this tool, it's a wonderful tool for teachers. 
You can use it during COVID crisis when you know get responses from students uh, in the form of word clouds. They'll be very happy to type responses and things like that. Okay, and the poll has reached full capacity because I'm using a free version. You can now use it up to 40 people. Okay, so you see all the 40 responses. It got really quickly full. Okay, so now I'm going to minimize the screen again, and I'm going to go back to my talk. So I hope you learned uh, the first software for the day. Okay, so one technology tool. So let me move on. Uh, and uh, yes, it'll be translated later on uh, uh, in YouTube in Spanish. Okay, and I'll try to speak slowly because there is a lot of uh, interesting things that you will learn. Okay, so poll everywhere. First uh, important technology tool. Now. I'm going to keep working with you a lot. So, you know, I want uh, this time you can use your chat box very uh, interestingly uh, to give me a response. Okay. Now I'm as a teacher, I'm asking you to respond and I want you to use creative math. I'm going to use math, but I'm going to not give you math problems. I'm going to give you something that is much easier. I'm going to flash some uh, interesting things on the screen and you're going to tell me what that, uh, what that a quantity is. In fact, the quantities are movies. Go ahead, type what you think the movie is. Yes, it's a pie. Oh, uh, Lisa, um, American pie. Well, Life of pie is an interesting guess, Abhilasha, but American flag on the pie is American pie. So what I'm noticed, what I'm doing here is getting you to talk about pie. As a student, you're talking about pie. You're talking about the American flag. So now you can bring geography and mathematics together and enjoy something that you others other people learn cherry pie hannah that's an interesting one okay now uh let's move on now that you get the drill i'm going to do more movies i know that some of you may have seen uh, a couple of other other talks but i i'm going to still uh have new movies for you don't worry okay so american pie it was okay get ready for the next one okay i want to see how how much uh you're using your creativity okay 1609.344 meters. What do you what do you think is the movie? Fantastic, John <laughs> from Suriname. So Green Mile. So first of all, you he uh, you realize that 1609.344 is one mile, and not only is the mile uh, uh, you know in meter conversion, you talk about conversion with your students, but it's in green. So it's the Green Mile. It's the it's a movie that uh, somebody got a supporting best supporting act, actor and things like that. So uh, eight miles. I don't see the eight there yet. But uh, the point is to get the students engaged in guessing uh, and then get the idea of estimation. For example, okay, get ready for the next one. That's Green Mile again. How about this one? Tom Hanks. That's right, Jim Barton. <laughs> Jim, thank you for joining. Mean Girls, Alisa, uh, you're on a roll. So there's girls, and then I'm adding all of them, and I'm taking the average. The synonym for average is mean, mean girls. Sorry, girls. Uh, so it's Mean Girls is the name of the movie. But notice that I did three movies, and I already talked about three different concepts. Mean as a concept, pie as a concept. And then we also talked about green mile, mile as a concept. And also I mixed it with colors. I mixed it with uh, uh, American flag. So you can talk about history, geography, lots and lots of things. Now, some of you have seen these three movies uh, because I understand that uh, when I did this at uh, other talks, this is already on vi viral across the world, but I have made some new movies just for today's uh, show, okay? So let's see, get ready for this one. This is Mean Girls, of course. How about this? Let's see. Put your creative hats together. This is a brand new movie. I made it just for this, this talk. Anyone? Tough one. Ah, interesting. Over 300 people across the world and no function. Very good guess. Uh, uh, Deborah George has seen the word function and no function. Uh, good guess, I would say. Uh, you know, Function of X, very good. So the function word was one of the keys there, but do not enter as like, it's not open to the public, it's private. The movie is called a private function, okay? So I made I made some tough movies. This is to raise the level in terms of guessing the movies. It's a private function, okay? Now let's try the next one. So now I'm being very 
uh, I'm increasing the level of difficulty. So, you know, as a teacher, you want to get everybody in included and then not just keep it at a, a, you know, the task very low. Cube, very good. You talked about a math word, cube. That's my goal is today you talk about cubes. But then I, I also sneak in a small symbol there. Uh, think inside the box. Very good. Uh, there is something uh, that involves mathematical symbols. There's an E, there's an I, and there's a pi. And it turns out that it's one of the most beautiful results in mathematics, e to the i pi plus 1, which actually is 0. Very good, Daniel. You actually figured out that e to the i pi plus 1 is 0. Now let's put the cube and the 0 together. What movie do you get? If you have not seen this movie, it's an interesting one. It's called Cube Zero. Okay? So now that you figured it out, uh, uh, you can actually start to realize the reason I'm doing this. Uh, and then let's do one more. How about this? So now, as I said, I'm raising the level here. But notice as a teacher, I'm making you talk about these things and uh, you are trying to guess because it, these are movies. These are hard movies. Flames, very good. It's a flame. And if you can recognize what that uh, shape is, uh, it's a mathematical shape, but it is also something that you sit on a horse. On a horse. Saddle, exactly, Hannah. So blazing saddles. That's the name of the movie. Okay, so there's this Cynthia Hobbs. Okay, welcome. Blazing Saddles. It is not many people. It's a uh, you know oh, uh, it's not many people may know. Last movie. Okay, go for it. What do you see? Time. Yes. Clock. Oh my God, Hannah. You are, you're a movie watcher. Good. Clock, work, orange. That's exactly right. Not only she recognized the clock, she saw the color was orange, but then she also added the word work. If you don't recognize the W equals F times D, that gives me a chance as a teacher to talk about force times distance as work. That's the W that is that you stand there for. So what I want you to understand is, as a teacher, in about three minutes, I made you talk about six different concepts. And that's the power of how you actually bring entertainment into teaching, okay? So, and uh, you can also talk about, and then use this as cues to see what students know and what students don't know. So both the activities that I did is a pre-assessment activity for me to know what you already know, because if you already know, I should not be wasting time as a teacher and teach that again to you. I should teach you what you don't know. So that's the whole point of it, okay? Now, now that you've enjoyed some movies with me, let's move on. Now I'm gonna play a completely different game here, okay? It's not a game. Again, I want you to give me inputs here. I'm going to show something on the screen and I'm going to take you to the next learning framework. The framework is called notice and wonder. Okay. And the notice is type anything that you notice. Go ahead and type anything that you notice. What do you notice? Wings, butterfly. Very good. Butterfly, orange, symmetry. You must be a mathematician. Fly, color. Very good. Spots, white, uh, Okay, fantastic, whole. So what you're actually observing is exactly, you know, stained glass, very good, okay. So that's great. So you guys, antenna, somebody noticed the antenna. Okay, now you notice those things. Now I want you to put your subject hat. Maybe you're a math teacher, you're a biology teacher, you're a chemistry teacher, you're a geography teacher. Now I want you to put your hat and now I want you to wonder, what do you wonder now about this picture? Wonder. What do you wonder? Oh, six legs. Does it have six legs? Is it symmetric? What do you wonder about the life cycle? You wonder if it's real. Actually, that's right. Is it uh, alive? Uh, divisions. How fast does it go? And now you're making the students, okay, biochemistry of the coloring. Fantastic. So what you're doing now is getting them excited to notice something and then asking them to wonder about something. How much does it weigh? Uh, and I'm looking for somebody to tell me, Ah, Mayla is saying, has it been to Mexico? Very good clue. Anyone wonder why she's talking about Mexico? Anyone wants to take a guess why she's talking about Mexico? Nobody talked about, oh, monarch, there it is. Somebody carry, somebody says monarch butterflies and they are indeed monarch butterflies. Monarch butterflies that fly all the way from Canada to Mexico. And when they actually take that route, you can talk about the geography, where they stop, where you can talk about the life cycle, you can talk about uh, art, you can actually have them have the students actually talk about, uh, you know, different aspects of the 
of the musky of the uh, butterfly you know pupa larva the stages now uh, i work with several school districts and one of the school districts actually decided to create a project based learning called butterfly garden every school had to actually do a butterfly garden so they talked about mathematics what's the area of the garden what is the perimeter of the garden they talked about uh, history they talked about biology they talked about so this is how you bring a subject exciting into the classroom okay and so you can see this is not just a math subject this is not just a biology subject you're trying to integrate subject so try to always integrate the learning it becomes much more powerful so you you know just the math student that is very good in math is not the only one that's shining everybody get, gets to shine okay and that's the whole idea so that's the education for all concept i was telling you before now of course uh, uh rebecca introduced what stem was you all know what stem is science technology engineering mathematics uh, and everybody knows that you can actually expand this by adding the a to it can you say can you tell me what a stands for a would stand for arts very good so when you take the stem and the arts in it where you can actually draw the butterfly you can do a lot of things that's that makes it steam now what i did was i i thought you know how can you do science technology engineering arts mathematics if you don't understand what you are seeing what you are reading what you are writing so we decided to add and i created a concept called stream r stands for reading and writing and uh, and stem m is also a good one it's the medicine uh, added or health h is also added to it stem h now what i did was i introduced a concept called stream where r stands for reading slash writing you can think of writing as a why do i do that well we stream movies we stream audios we stream videos it's time to stream education that was the whole idea okay so let's start streaming education was my concept the ing stands for inspiring the next generation so science technology reading engineering arts mathematics to inspire you could if you want to say improve to innovate you know the next generation that's the whole idea and so this uh, concept has now become very big and i want to share with you how it has impacted many countries starting with this one so i know that uh, all the people from suriname maybe your picture is right here and uh, i you are actually seeing the minister of education that is standing right in the center i'm standing somewhere in the crowd with all the other wonderful wonderful teachers there that i get got to work with and who are making a big change in the country what do i mean by change you are seeing children building hydroponics children third grade fourth grade fifth grade sixth grade they are building hydroponics and learning the biology mathematics everything that's stream to you combining everything okay you're seeing students engage in electricity learning by doing on the left side and i'm going to tell you more about these things and how this program came about and b streaming is basic education science technology reading engineering mathematics to inspire the next generation so let me tell you a little bit more so the idea was to actually combine or integrate science with technology with reading with engineering arts and mathematics now the students should not be just thinking one subject how i mean and you and the teacher should not only be teaching one subject the math teacher should be able to talk about the history the history teacher should be able to talk about the geography the geography teacher should talk about the science and that's the whole power of uh, this this concept and you can see it's supported by the ministry of education and there's that video you it'll tell you exactly what the program is about i'm very thankful that this was supported by the idb which is uh, uh, you know you all know is a is a bank that actually supports many of these projects that have had a lot of impact in many countries also and oas uh, i'm going to tell you how this uh, concept was supported by the oas to uh, other countries also and i see many of your kind of many of the countries are represented here but how do we bring about a change you have a concept and how do we bring about the change well first you have a purpose in plan from the purpose and plan or a idea you want to come up with some kind of a, a you know program or a project i'm using all piece so the project was about identifying how to divide the whole country into different uh, sites in each side we identified school districts in each school district and we identified clusters and we named people to lead those pieces so it was a much it's a big project okay and uh, and we wanted to actually of course without people you cannot do anything so purpose 
a project and people, you know, so you bring them together, you, you work with them, you train them, and then they take on uh, as leaders uh, and build capacity in the country. And what happens? Well, you basically work with them. You work with the teachers. So we gave, you know, we trained over thousand teachers in the last three years. Um, and through, and then we also work with students. These teachers go back to schools and work with a concept, which I'll explain later. It's called the five E's. I'm going to talk about a bunch of learning frameworks. Engage, learn to engage the students first. Have them explore, have them explain what they understand, have them elaborate what they, uh, what they understand from learning from other people and have them evaluate each other. Once again, engage, explore, explain, elaborate and evaluate. It's 5E. If you can bring that into your lesson plans, teachers, you will see how your lessons are going to be much, much stronger. Okay. Now, not only did we do that, we were able to engage, we were able to have these uh, teachers that I worked with uh, were able to go and make, uh, you know, uh, transform uh, the school system in the, in the country. But all this is not possible without the support of a minister. So I always get to work with the Ministry of Education and the minister. And not only did we work with the whole country, but we created kits. Thanks to uh, the IDB, we were able to create kits, uh, how, you know, for every single school with a complete stream uh, products inside science activities, technology activities, reading activities, arts activities, math activities. It's all in the kit and every school actually gets to work with these kits and all that stuff. Okay. Yes. Elicit and extend. Fantastic. I love that. Okay. So this concept was not just in Suriname. I've taken it to uh, Zanzibar and Tanzania. And what you're seeing is students in Tanzania, this, this, this one I'll tell you in just a second, he's talking about a drone to the kids. Uh, this is the vice president that, that we are explaining virtual reality. Uh, if you recognize this, uh, the picture on the left, there are teachers standing in two lines. Anyone here wants to take a very creative guess on what the, what the teachers are doing? Any guesses? I made the teachers stand in two lines. Is there a biology teacher here. This is a workshop it's, uh, you know, I was giving, uh, you know, parallel lines. Very good guess. I like that, uh, Sarita. That's really interesting. Okay. Uh, yes, I made teachers stand in two lines. If there's a biology teacher, any other ideas? DNA. Wow. You guys are really superb. DNA. Essentially, I wanted to teach them about adenine, thymine, guanine, cytosine, and how they actually combine. I made each one of them become an amino acid. And they actually had to pair up and understand different mutations. So this is where you engage them in role playing and help them understand some really complicated concept. And that's the power, actually, okay, of teaching a lot of uh, you know interesting things by role playing and not with the students. First, do it with the teachers, and then the teachers will do it with the students. Okay. So that was a big festival that was uh, engaged three thousand people in the country. Now. Jamaica. I see a lot of people from Jamaica. I see Dr. Uh, Joseph Thomas there and I see uh, lots and lots of you. Bhagya, I'm sure I'm seeing you right there. So this is the group that I got to interact with uh, through the uh, through OAS project and we were able to work with 40 teachers. Each of the teachers went and actually impacted 10 other teachers. We were able to get to more than 400 teachers in just three months. Okay, so uh, it's a it's a fantastic way to actually reach out. And not only that, uh, the what you're seeing in the bottom here is uh, one, two, three, four, five, six teachers practicing. And I'm not I don't have time to talk about this. Something called six, three, five. They're actually each coming up with a lesson plan. Six people, and they're and the lesson plan is passed to the next person, and the next person writes three ideas to improve your lesson plan for five minutes, and then they move the lesson plan to the next person, and that goes on for half an hour. It's called six, three, five. Try it out. This is how the power screwdriver was invented. I draw a screwdriver, I give it to the next person. The next person is a mechanical engineer, he draws a knob. The next person, he transfers to the electrical engineer, he puts a button to it. Out comes a power screwdriver. So the idea is to actually, it is a building up of ideas. Try that to your lesson plan. We did this in Jamaica. It was fantastic. And we were able to use this very powerful tool. Six, three, five. One more framework for you. Not only did we, we did it with Jamaica, we did it with Bahamas. What you're seeing is a technique that I present called affinity mapping. This is to prioritize 
what they should be teaching and how they should be teaching. And here the teacher is so excited that she's building a drone, believe it or not, they're building drone. It's called learning by doing, okay? A very powerful strategy. And they are learning about math, physics, everything, science, art, everything in one shot, okay? And then they will, of course, teach it to the students and all that. And my friends from Belize, uh, I saw some of you from Belize. I'm sure your pictures are on here. And this is, of course, translated also to different countries. Thanks to the OAS, I was able to reach to multiple countries and uh, able to take this concept to many, many, many countries, okay? So I want to share with you in the next uh, probably half an hour or so, uh, many more techniques, okay? So as you're listening in, uh, just take, uh, take as much as you can. Uh, and if you want to know more, feel free to contact me. Of course, we are, you know, the crisis has really put us in a lot of uh, uh, troubling situations. But at the same time, think about it as given us a chance to become creative, okay? Creative with student support, creative with instruction, creative with how we plan the units, creative with the assessments that we are actually going. Ultimately, our goal is what? Every child, okay? Right to education. That's the goal. So what we don't want in a classroom is this students being treated as consumers. Students are not consumers. Students are producers of information. Remember that, okay? Students are not consumers. If you'd start treating them as numbers, then I wouldn't say you're a good teacher, okay? Students are not consumers. They are producers of information. Not only are they producers of information, they can actually peer reviewers, listening to each other and understanding what uh, each other understand. Now, how do you bring that into a classroom? Well, through what is called as 21st century skills. And we'll talk about this more. So the most important message I want to give you, I'll give you some messages here and uh, now and then, is we need to you know, not just prepare students for tests. We need to prepare students for life. What do I mean by that? It's about lifelong learning skills. What happens is we end up teaching content, discipline specific, and then they become a scientist or a technology specialist or a social scientist. So it becomes very siloed. But on the other hand, if you actually start to prepare students for competencies, uh, you know, I'll talk about more about competencies, then that's transferable skills. So, uh, you know, every school district is trying to actually build, you know, are trying to actually build a parallel between content and competency. So let's all not just focus on content-based education. Please also start focusing on competency-based education. This message is for the ministries out there, all the ministries of education. Please hear from me. Let's not just uh, you know, prepare students for tests. Let's also start preparing students for life. Please use that as a slogan to go back and talk to your ministry folks, okay? So where are the competencies coming from? The standard ones, critical thinking, creativity, communication, collaboration, making students talk in the classroom, make, giving students the space to think and be creative, allowing them to make mistakes because just because they made a mistake, you don't give them a zero, have them, you know, test it out again and things like that. That's where the art of the teacher comes in. Okay. Now I'll give you an example. Creativity is one of the very hard thing. And you probably saw the example that I'm going to do. If I flash a picture like this and I say, what do you see? Well, most of you are seeing dots, maybe. You're like, oh, colored dots. Oh, green dots. Computational thinking, I love it. Okay, so this is a course that I teach and I see many of the teachers. And already somebody's, uh, somebody's very creative. They saw a cat. Oh my God, how did they see a cat? Well, first you need to build the knowledge. You want to understand what could this mean? Maybe these are cities in a, in a, in a map. Okay, that is building knowledge. From knowledge, you can build experience. You can say, how are these connected? Right now, the connection, of course, somebody's seeing a dog, somebody's seeing a rainy day. Fantastic. I love the creativity here. Then somebody saw a cat. You know, so the idea is basically how do you go from the knowledge piece to creativity piece? It's not easy. Okay. So it's a it's a really interesting way you can actually bring this into the into the teaching. So along with the four C's, communication, collaboration, creativity, uh, uh, critical thinking, I have written about five new pedagogical C's I'm going to teach you today. And if anybody wants this, I will be happy to share the paper. To do any, uh, you know, to build competencies, you need to start with the context. The context would be, you know, uh, your own city, your own town, your own district, your own uh, problems, your own challenges. You start with the context. The context will lead to a curriculum that will help you create a map. 
this is where you create your standards, your learning lines and all these things. From the curriculum, you develop content. We often are just doing the content without understanding the curriculum. We do the curriculum without understanding the context. And that's the challenge, okay, in many countries. So we need to develop content, the right content from the curriculum map that we are doing. Once you have the content, then you develop concepts on how to teach it, the pedagogical uh, strategies that you need to engage in. And when you do that, you automatically develop competencies, not just competencies for problem solving, competencies like collaboration, communication, critical thinking, creativity, also competencies for global, competencies for service learning, competencies for research, competencies for data, many other competencies that needs to come in, okay? Now that's a new uh, C, again, those that are interested, please contact me, I'll tell you how I created this theory, okay? Now, when I show you this picture, now I'm gonna show you a bunch of learning frameworks that are very, very exciting. What you're seeing this is three children in the park holding a stick. What do you think they are doing? What do you think they are doing with a stick in the park? Wind direction, fishing, very good. Fishing for what? Fishing for what? Measuring distance, uh, Daniel, be clear much more. So uh, measuring is good. Measuring what? Measuring what? Height of trees, fantastic. So here is a teacher trying to teach the uh, height of a tree by taking the children outside the classroom. This is called experiential learning. Now on the right side, you're seeing students uh, these are graduate students. So you can imagine kindergarten and first grade and second grade students on one side and uh, graduate students on the other side doing the exact same thing. On the right side, they're actually measuring, uh, you know, environmental pollutants in the water and things like that. Okay. So you can definitely look for wind direction. This is just a bamboo skewer. What they are going to be doing is they're going to compare the height that they have and the height of the tree. And then what you don't see in the picture intentionally, there is another student and that student's height is going to be measured. And uh, there is a, this is to teach ratios and proportions, believe it or not, okay? Teaching ratios and proportions and fractions. How do you do it with experiential learning? Angles of elevation. I know you must be a high school teacher uh, teaching trigonometry and things like that. Now, how about innovative learning? You ask in the exam a child, which is the biggest planet, which is the smallest planet, uh, which is the planet with, uh, uh, with rings. Of course, if they make it, get it wrong, you immediately give them zero. Well, you didn't even give a chance for them to experience the planets. So it turns out uh, it's under $5. You can actually go and get, this is called the Google Glasses. This is innovative learning. Uh, give, a, give them this Google Glasses. It's a simple cell phone app. You can actually put the solar, you can download it, it's free, solar system, for example. And you can actually put it inside your, in, inside the Google Glasses. And you can actually have the child see uh, everything in two minutes. It's like they're in a spaceship and they're seeing all the planets. And you know what? They will never make a mistake again. Okay, so try this. So this is how we bring technology, latest state of the art technology into the classroom. Okay, now the way we teach mathematics, let me take a topic. Four divided by half. What do we do? We say four divided by half. Write it as a fraction. And then we do one of the biggest mistakes as teachers. We say, flip and multiply. And you're like, the students never even ask you, why am I doing this? No, no, it's a rule. Just memorize it, it'll be in the exam. That's what most teachers do. But when the child asks that question, this is your responsibility to explain, why did you say flip and multiply? So think carefully, where did that even come from? Because you learned it that way. And you wanna pass that on to the student, but this generation students, are asking you why and you want to be ready to answer that why okay uh, and so I want to make sure for all those uh, you know justification you could say four divided by half uh, you know I can tell you in mathematics you will probably say oh I'm going to talk about multiplicative inverse multiplicative identity I'm going to multiply and divide by something called 202 and so you can explain it mathematically but you're going to lose a child by the way if you explain it this way yes you can appeal to eighth graders, ninth graders, but you will totally lose the kindergartner, first grader, and second grader. So the question, Daniel, is, is right, right to the point. How do we do four divided by two? Let's think for a second. Let's turn mathematics into English, stream. How many twos are in four? That's the English question corresponding to the math problem. So which means if I take a chocolate bar, 
which has four pieces, you ask how many twos are in four? Of course, there are two, uh, you know, two, and that's the answer is two. Repeated subtraction, I love that. You're a math, math teacher. So how do we turn this idea that I just said into four divided by a half? Well, it's very simple. How many halves are in four? Same question. So what if I take the same candy bar, but I divide this into halves now and ask yourself, how many halves are in four? Well, of course, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and there's eight halves. There it is. And just like that, you just convinced a second grader. And that's the power of teaching, you know, teaching the way they understand. And it's very, 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 very important. All these other things are rules. Don't just teach procedures, teach concepts. That's the most important thing. Okay. Now, I hope you started liking math. Okay. Now, this is very important. I'm flashing a problem. Only the people from Suriname are probably going to understand this. Why? Because it's in Dutch. Now, the rest of you are, are like, oh my God, I'm language challenged here. I am language challenged also because, but if you look, look at that carefully, maybe you can make sense of what is going on. It seems like it's talking about passengers in a bus. It says something like one third of the passengers get down at the first stop and then the bus keeps going. Half of the passengers, remaining passengers get down and the bus keeps going. There's five passengers in the bus. How many total passengers were at the beginning? Very complicated uh, problem for children, for adults too, because I know many of them make mistakes on this, okay? But the question is, how do you explain it? So there's, you, want, you want the teachers to go through this and actually help other teachers. So that's exactly what we did. We created through this grant uh, videos. And what you're seeing is uh, Marion Jones, a teacher from Suriname, actually explaining the steps just like every teacher in the world will write. Of course, some teachers will say X and things like that and only cater to have one third of the students. And here is an arithmetic way. Again, you only cater to one third of the students. Who are they? They are the students that can listen to you. These students are called auditory learners. The problem is by only reaching to those learners, you miss the students that enjoy drawing. They want to actually think of the bus as three pieces. Why? Because you said one third. And then they basically take off pieces. One, one, one piece comes out and then you have two pieces. And then one other piece comes out and then there's five people. Well, of course there are 15 people. That kid will get it immediately because that's a pictorial learner. Okay, so visual learner. So you now captured the rest of the class. But then there is one more group of kids that we tend to forget. These kids really need to learn by doing kinesthetic learners. So it's very important as a teacher, you bring visual learning, kinesthetic learning, and auditory learning into your classroom. Only then you are catering to all the students in the classroom. Now, inquiry-based learning, another a very important practical approach. So where you actually have, uh, this is the program that I was talking about, focus. The girls are actually sitting and enjoying some experiment. What you see here is a solar panel, and there is a, a, a bulb that is actually flashing uh, you know, on the solar panel. So obviously, and that solar panel is connected to the pump here, that's the solar pump, and water is coming out. So the kids are excited, but then you ask the question, if I change the wattage of the bulb from 20 watts to 40 watts to 60 watts to 100 watts, will the height of the fountain go up or down? Inquiry-based learning. You can ask another question. What if I close the... Uh, uh, solar panel, half of it, will the fountain go half the height or double the height? Inquiry-based learning. Now, you have to understand, if this is a physics lab, and you're making them do some interesting mathematics. They can actually take numbers, they can put a table, they can put a graph. So this is where you're really leading them to discovery learning. So remember to bring these types of activities into the classroom, okay? Why do roofs fly? Don't go into a high school classroom and Pretend you are the best physics teacher and say, today I'm going to teach you dash. Well, those physics teachers out there, can you tell me why I'm asking this question? How do roofs fly? Anyone? What am I teaching that day in the classroom? Well, it turns out it's a very important concept and the concept is called Bernoulli's principle. Unfortunately, if you go into the classroom and say, I'm going to teach you Bernoulli's principle, I'm going to write down equations, you just lost everybody. Instead, you actually ask them a question like, why do roofs fly? And then start to make them think, well, 
if you start to make them think outside of the roof, very good, uh, 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 Aldrin, very good. So it's about the, the relationship between pressure and velocity. So outside the uh, roof, the speed is very, very high. It's low pressure. Inside your house, no, less velocity, more pressure, high pressure to low pressure, the roofs fly. And that is the concept behind Bernoulli's principle. So if you actually engage students that way, it's really going to change, make the difference. They will at least remember the name, maybe not the formula, but at least they'll start to remember how to get to there. Learning by doing, as I said, talking about drones, making, using simple resources, teaching advanced concepts by simple resources. That's the idea. And uh, you can see, you don't need to build an electronic arm. You can build arm with uh, things that you find from dustbins, trash, okay? Syringe, thrown shell syringe, and you can actually make them move a robotic arm, okay? With just, that's a robotic arm under $1, okay? So now, collaborative learning. Unfortunately, we are not in a setup like COVID where we can do collaborative learning, but what you're seeing is a student's or engaged in the classroom. It's super important to actually, uh, you know, practice this in the classroom, okay? Collaborative learning. Active learning, I told you already. This is a room at uh, George Mason University where I teach. I teach in this room. If you look at the picture there, you don't find the teacher. You don't even know where the teacher is. We are all used to going to the front of the classroom and showing our rears to the students and start writing on the board. Please stop doing that be in the center of the classroom and have the children actually spread all around you and have them go to the boards. Even better, this particular room, all the walls are writable. So that's the fantastic uh, nature of active learning. So because everything is public, okay? So challenge-based learning. I want to just ki kind of finish with some very important thing. This is something I've been practicing a lot. Challenge-based learning. Don't give a simple problem. Give them a very high-level problem. Don't think your kids cannot do it. They will really crack this idea. Where do you go for a context? Go to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, SDG 2030. Pick whatever you want. Right now, COVID falls under goal number three, good health and well-being. Now, those of you that would like to read another paper that I just finished, uh, how I connected COVID to all the other 16 challenges. And I'm happy to share that with you also, okay? Now, uh, spread of diseases. Yes, maybe it's a sensitive topic to talk about, it's in good health and well-being, goal number three. But, you know, think about it. One of the subjects that children hate in mathematics, exponential growth. Well, think about it. One person starts to sneeze. That person gives it to another person. That's two. Then those two people give it to four people. The four people give it to eight people. Eight people give it to 16 people. Exponential growth. This is, by the way, now you start to realize COVID is a, what is called as a super spreader one going to 10 people. Now the students realize, oh my God, these are big numbers. Now we need to start dealing with big numbers. So now you start to realize, of course, if it's a high school student and beyond, you, you give them bigger theories, you introduce them to calculus, and then talk about susceptible, infected, recovered. If you have high school students who want to do research projects, please let me know. And then bring mosquito inside because diseases can be spread through vectors, not just you know a transmission direct contact. You have different types of diseases, AIDS, uh, influenza falls into direct transmission, and then you got chikungunya, dengue, Zika, all these things fall into another category. Then you start to bring together diseases that, that can be solved together and so on. Now, I want to uh, come back to schooling again, and I'll just take maybe five to 10 more minutes and I'll wrap up. I, I'm very, uh, you know, I work with lots of uh, 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 teachers. I see many of you from Fairfax here. Uh, you know, thank you to what you do every day. And, uh, you know, they have their portrait of a graduate and all these different things. But when COVID hit them, one of the biggest challenges was how do we distribute food? Just to give you an idea, Fairfax is the 10th biggest uh, school district in the United States. 189,000 students. Now, countries like Suriname, you have 600,000 people in the entire country. This one school district has 189,000 students. 60,000 of those students, they need breakfast and lunch every day. Now, think about it. COVID happened. Where are they going to go eat? Where is the food? How is the food going to be distributed with social distancing? Now, it's amazing how the district actually came together with a plan and actually, you know, uh, you can use technology to find where you go and pick up the food and things like that. But you're talking really big numbers here. That gives you an opportunity to teach 
about how many, and I want you to uh, go back and think about a very famous physicist. His name is Enrico Fermi. What he would do is he will come into the classroom and post a challenge. He'll say, how many popcorn kernels are in the room? And the kids are like, what do you mean? That's a lot. Yes, I need you to tell me how many are there. So what he's trying to make them think is, is Fermi problems. Aldred, fantastic, is thinking about Fermi. These are called as Fermi problems. It makes you think about estimation and coming close to what could be the actual answer. How many cell phones are being used right now in the world? How many passenger cars? It's fantastic. Think about COVID. Think about children asking, you know, how many tennis balls? Change that to tennis balls filling the room. How many? So allow them to make mistakes. It's not an exact answer, but it's an approximate good guess. And then they, then they can actually try this. Fermi, F-E-R-M-I, that's his name. Look up Fermi problems. An appropriate problem that we have given to Fairfax County. Toilet tissue paper. One of the first things that disappeared when COVID happened. Just all the stores were out of toilet paper. And imagine schools ordering toilet paper. How many purchase orders? Imagine a school district like Fairfax County, 189,000 students. How many toilet paper tissues should they order? Do the math, do the science, and you will realize how good it is to bring these types of problems into the classroom without giving them stress, okay? Integrated teaching. So last few philosophies, uh, I already talked about uh, integrate, uh, you know, uh, uh, everything from engaging the students, ex make them explore, have them explain, let them elaborate and let them evaluate each other, okay? Performance-based assessment, we all love to make exams, but please understand making little exams. These are called formative assessments. You don't have to wait till, you know, I, I came from India. I used to take like two exams, a midterm exam and a final exam. And my whole grade was based on that. You know how many students fail because of the, just that? Think about your countries. Give what is called as formative assessments. Little, 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 little quizzes that add up to the final. Okay, don't just keep 50% for the midterm and 50% for the final or 100% for the final. Give little pieces, 1%, 2% for the every day, give them something. What I gave you today, Mohan, at the beginning is a pre-assessment. I would have given 1% for that, for the poll everywhere. I would have given 1% for the movie quizzes. That's how you actually create uh, your curriculum. Now think about it. I have the picture of a soup there. You go to a restaurant and you try to order soup and you try to get soup and when the soup comes to your table, it's very tasty. Why? Because the chef inside makes the soup, tastes it and realizes, oh, it needs salt. He puts some salt. He tastes it. He realizes it needs some spice. He puts some spice. What he's doing is formative assessment. What you're doing is summative assessment. I hope you will remember the soup example for the rest of your life when you make your next exam, okay? So remember the soup example, formative, summative. The next thing that you need to uh, make uh, important is differentiate in instruction. If you ask a student, what is pi? Be very creative and, and be clear in what you're asking. Pi could mean like an actual pi that you eat. Pi could mean the symbol. Pi could you know mean different things. So, you know, account for differentiated instruction in the classroom. Understand it's education for all, not for some, okay? Very, very important. So it's equality versus equity. PBL, another thing people just throw around. I see all these education people not really understanding. When I, when I say, what is PBL again? They say project-based learning or, or problem-based learning. When I ask them the difference, most people don't have a clue on what the differences are. Well, they are actually significantly different, by the way, okay? Problem-based learning really has some you know, yes, open-ended, but it has some instructions to it also, okay? I can spend a whole lecture on this, but I don't have the time. Here's an example of a classic problem-based learning. What problem do I want to solve? Well, I, I want to solve, uh, you know, I have, when I was drinking soup, I have something on my mush. I want to somehow clean. I want a napkin to come and clean my mush. How do I do that? Well, that napkin needs to be moved by a, a clock. How does the clock uh, ring the alarm? Well, when a rocket actually goes up. How does the rocket go up? Well, it's because of this bucket. This bucket is turned because of the bird. How does the bird turn? Because of this. This chain is called Rube Goldberg. Bring this into your classroom and you'll be pleasantly surprised how creative children can get. That's a practical example of a problem-based learning, okay? Project-based learning. Ask them to look around. Turtles in the water, saving plastics. Ask them to think about how they can connect what they are learning to, the, to the, what they are actually uh, understanding. 
Two last uh, uh, things I want to teach you, human-centered approach to problem solving. Give them challenges that they can relate to and actually be able to solve for not yourself, but for others. Human-centered uh, approach to problem solving, not for solving problems for yourself, but for others. Give, let me give you an example. Children with cancer going to a hospital and they're asked to go into the MRI machine and they're afraid, afraid, really afraid. And I already see Anutra saying, yes, I am a, I'm an expert in design thinking and I teach a class on this thing. And the children are afraid, they're crying to get into the machine. How do you solve this problem? What strategies will you use? You ask the doctors, they'll say, give them ice cream. This is their doctor's answer. You ask the nurses, they'll say something else. You ask the parents, the parents are crying. They're also, you know, so how do you solve this problem? Anyone, can, can somebody actually give me an idea uh, on how you would solve this problem, real world problem? Children with cancer, not wanting to go. Ask a child, fantastic. Ask a child, people forget to ask the child. They ask everyone else, the doctors and all this stuff. Ask the right people. That's called empathy. Step number one of design thinking. Define your problem statement. Ideate solutions. Create a prototype. Test your solution. And this is how somebody won $25,000 and made the whole hospital, the MRI room, like a treasure hunt for children. The children went and actually, you know, did some weights and they got a ticket like they are going to an adventure theme park and they, they love the experience. It's about the experience for the child. And that's what we need to do as teachers and educators, okay? It's called design thinking. Last one. If I asked you today to say how to make toast, you're like, wait, what are you asking? Well, how do you make toast? Well, when you say, how do you make toast? Some of you are gonna do this. You're gonna, you know, cut the bread and then put the bread in the toaster and the toaster comes out. You're gonna show me every single step of making a toast and then nicely putting peanut butter and jam and doing it. Some of you are probably gonna just be very sloppy and say, I'm just gonna put the bread inside and then I'm gonna get the toast. Now, and then you go through this experience and then you realize some of you are all about the toast. All you are thinking about is, oh, I'll just put the bread and I'll get a toast. You're not thinking about the process. Some of you are just about the transformation of the toast. What do I put on the toast and make it uh, taste good? And then, some of you are about the toaster. You know how much I put it in, I put it out. So your pictures are going to be like this. And those engineers out there, you're going to be showing me this. I've seen this happen. You're going to be showing me how the toaster was made with all the engineering gadgets and all that stuff. Okay. And then some of you are all about the people. You see happy people in the pictures. And then some of you are all about the experience. Experience that, you know, you go through in terms of the toast and you have a happy face at the end. And some of you are all about supply chain, going to the store, buying the bread, and then all the way, uh, you know, serving the toast on a plate, right? And then some of you go all the way back to the field where you are actually growing the, you know, uh, corn and the, you know, uh, farmer and, you know, then actually, uh, dough, you know, make the dough and things like that, you know, bake the bread and all that stuff, right? So everybody is different. Please understand that, okay? What's common though about these things? Every one of them had some kind of a, a step. These steps we call as nodes. And then these nodes were related by links. Now, relating the nodes and the links is what is called as a systems model. So try to bring systems thinking, appreciate different perspectives. In the United States, we make toast using a toaster. In Europe, they make toast using an actual pan. The students in the, you know, I know they make toaster like this. They just put it on, on, on top of fire. Okay. So, but appreciate the perspectives that people are bringing into making toast. So if you actually think about how we all think, some of you are probably making very simple steps in the way you teach, in the way you actually present material, maybe very trivial. Some of you are too much. You overkill, you prepare to the minute. And you know, I have seen teachers saying at 223, I will teach this. I mean, I'm like, how do you, how do you know at 223 you'll do this? You, can, you don't have to be so precise and you know, so many notes and all that stuff. Some of you are very reasonable, right? So, and uh, what I want you to uh, think about is when you actually take that idea and work in teams, then you get what is called a systems thinking. You got to be careful. If the systems thinking is done by six people that are all blind, blind as a figure of speech, one is going to touch the ear and then say, oh, I'm touching a, uh, you know, a carpet. 
One is going to touch a trunk of the elephant and say, I'm touching a snake. Another one is going to touch the tusk and say, oh, I'm touching an, uh, a spear. One is going to touch the body and say, I'm touching a tree and a wall and a rope. What is going to happen if we don't come together and if we think in our silos, we are going to create this. Ask yourself, do you want your children to have something like this? So we need to actually bring together different perspectives and create a common framework. My last slide. Let's all move from teacher directed to learner centered. Let's think about interactive exchange rather than direct instruction. Let's focus on skills and not just on knowledge. Let's also talk about the process and not just the content, content, content. Let's talk about applied skills, not just basic skills and just pass the exam. Okay. Let's talk about questions and problems rather than facts only. Okay. Let's talk about practical stuff, not just theory. Let's talk about projects, not just uh, curriculum. Okay. Project based learning. You know, and then on demand, you know, don't just say, I want to teach from two o'clock to 223 this much. Be flexible. Okay. And then personalize, try to make it personalized for the uh, kinesthetic learner, for the visual learner and different types of learners and uh, collaborative rather than competitive. You know, it's too much competition, CAPE exam and this exam and that exam. And then you complain only 3% of the people passed in the country. Why? Because it's the way we teach. Right. So and then global community rather than just a classroom, have multiple classroom talk to each other. And OAS has a fantastic project called Global Classrooms with FCPS. And then make it web based, make it technology based, formative, include formative training, formative assessments. My final thing, help students learn for life, not for school. OK, if you want to learn more about my philosophies, you're welcome to see my TED talk, TEDx talk and I talk about more things. They may sound controversial, but I'm just speaking the facts. Thank you very much, okay? I'll stop here, and you're welcome to take a picture of this and contact me anytime, okay? Uh, Rebecca, I'm open for questions. Excellent, thank you so much um, for sharing so many, such a diversity of ideas for us. Um, so we have a number of questions. I actually want to start with the most recent question because it's um, directly aligned with the times in which we find ourselves. So the first question is, um, how can we use these exciting tools when we cannot reach our students during this COVID crisis, since a large percentage of our students have no access to the technological resources? Thank you very much. And I think this is a fantastic question. I want to uh, tell you the innovation that the Minister of uh, Suriname actually came up with. Uh, she said she may actually join today, but I'm not sure if she's in this crowd. Um, so in Suriname, we created all this material, 100 kits and all that stuff, and, uh, and then COVID hit. So one of the things they are doing right now is actually using television, radio, and actually the people that we, tra that I, you know, we train that build capacity, they are making personal videos. And these videos, these are teachers, teacher leaders, people from the ministry, they are actually creating the only, the minister decided that the only way to uh, deliver the instructional plan for distance education was through TV. Now, many people have cell phones, TV. Now, if they still don't have that, then it's our responsibility to not just use hi-fi things to teach fractions or whatever. Ask them to teach fractions with bottle caps, rocks. I'm just taking fractions as an example. You know, teach with available resources. There's wonderful things happening in Jamaica. And you're going to have a speaker in a few weeks who's going to share some really cool things that she's doing about, you know, how to engage students with simple things in the classroom. So videos speak a lot. So try to take advantage of videos and, of course, to transmit communication. Internet is not the only way to doing it. People watch TV all the time. Otherwise, kids get bored. Parents get bored. You get bored. You know, you are on TV. So, so I think use those types of mediums. And, and this is where a powerful uh, entity like a Ministry of Education comes in. So that was a brilliant plan, but, and that's, the, that's adopted in the entire country, but it takes policy decisions, really real policy decisions, and that can only come from higher up. Thank you. Um, another question, this was from early in your presentation. A key theme here is that, in, uh, is that of engagement, which is excellent. However, to what extent should entertainment be part of formal teaching and learning? I, I, uh, I, if I, if you were to ask me, I would make my class. And I mean, I'm, I'm the joker in the classroom. So, you know, I think, uh, so entertainment is, is, uh, is very personal. 
Entertainment may make people laugh. Entertainment may make people happy. And so it's about how you actually bring those things out from the student. And entertainment may simply mean satisfaction. So entertainment does not mean that everybody has to do the same thing. They can all do different things. And so the art of presenting the material is to make sure that that person who likes to be entertained by being happy, you make them happy. The person that likes to actually laugh, you make them laugh. The person you, who likes to be entertained uh, by jumping out of their chair, you make them jump out of their chair. And I think entertainment doesn't, doesn't mean it's like watching movies. It's about having them make mistakes. And the final thing is having them make mistakes. When I showed American Pie, somebody said Life of Pie. At that point, I wouldn't say, Abhilasha, I remember you said Life of Pie. I would not say you are wrong. And that's what most teachers end up doing is saying, oh, you sit down. That's wrong. Don't do that. Ask them, why did they say Life of Pie? Because they, they identified pie, it's about the life of, how did they put the life of for that picture? Maybe American flag made life, you know, so if they can give a good explanation, then you should give them the credit. The challenge here is to actually train teachers and the ministries on how to create rubrics to grade these things. And that's the thing. How do you grade entertainment and the responses you get for entertainment? Right. I am going to combine two questions, which are related, but they're actually a little bit different. Um, the first question um, has to do with how do we integrate something like the 5E model into national assessments? Oh. And that's linked to a question uh, from another person who says, practically, how do we incorporate things like applying skills and projects when, um, you know, as math teachers you know, and students, for example, they're evaluated paid or receive scholarships based upon how they perform on tests that are really content based, like potentially SAT, AP, standardized exams, um, college entrance and placement exams, etc. Thank you for that great, great question. It's not just the United States, it's in every country that I work with. Uh, and uh, I do work with more than 20 countries. So in the United States yesterday, let me give you an example, five high school students already called me. And they for the first time ever, the AP calculus exam, which is over three hours with the whole section on multiple choice and the whole section on uh, free response. That means you write open-ended questions. Got, the whole test got condensed into 45 minutes because of COVID. And there were only two questions and both questions were open-ended response. Many children came out crying because this is not what they prepared for for the entire life. Why did they start crying? Because that score is going to decide where they are going to college. So, but, so this is where those two questions need to be cleverly. I assume so who had made the questions uh, made it very well. So the answer to one of the answers, in fact, uh, this problem came in Suriname too, because most tests are multiple choice. If you give, continue to give multiple choice, two students will finish the test with CCCCC and then they'll be done. Uh, you know, removing half of the test for multiple choice and adding things like explain your thinking. Add that one phrase to every question. Well, that means the children could explain using a picture. The children could explain using a picture and a verbal. The children could explain using a picture, verbal, and a table. A children could explain using a picture, verbal, table, and a graph. Now, what I just gave you is a way to think about a rubric. If the child did not say anything, even though they are the smartest, you think, because they can only do a formula, then give them one point. If they can actually write the formula and explain it, give them two points. If they can write the formula and explain it and draw a diagram, give them three points. That's how you create a rubric, a performance-based assessment. Many of the ministries need to know how to learn how to do this. Even the United States are not good at this. So it's super important to really work from high level to create rubrics that reflect these exams and you're right, that does take a, a big change. It's a paradigm shift that has to go through. It's a big transformation. So you can't just do it overnight. It really takes professional development because many countries, for again, Suriname or Jamaica, for example, they have somebody called inspectors. They have the minister and they have the curriculum developers. Then they have the inspectors who go and inspect teachers. I hate that word, by the way. Uh, but, you know, inspect as an evaluators, you just go into the classroom and say, if the teacher is doing this, 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 it's check boxes. Inspectors need to be trained how to actually evaluate how, what the teacher is doing. Sometimes the teacher is really exciting the students, but the inspector does not know how to evaluate that. So there needs to be inspector professional development. 
there needs to be teacher profession development all across assessment, okay? Performance-based assessment. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to again link some questions here. Um, there are a number of people who are asking for additional resources on the 635 technique. Um, so I don't know if you want to address that now or if you want to perhaps share some resources. Yes, I have to share. Uh, I actually have a whole PowerPoint. I am teaching that uh, on uh, uh, to a whole class uh, uh, in a few days, and I have a whole PowerPoint on that. So the idea is, as I said, six people and 635 is just numbers okay if you're only four people so be it four people you sit together in a team that's the first number you come up with so many ideas maybe two ideas then call it four two and then you give five minutes for yourself but the most important thing with 635 is do not change the previous person's idea that's the most important challenge that you have somebody is giving you their lesson plan respect the lesson plan and build on it example Somebody is giving an English lesson plan. Maybe you can add a geography piece to it. Maybe you can say, hey, you could maybe add the 5E design to it. And then the lesson plan goes to the next person. That person will add a smart goal to it. And that is what I was able to work with the teachers in Jamaica, Belize, Bahamas, uh, and Suriname. So I think this is very important. Uh, and for ex especially teachers, take your lesson plan, sit with six of your colleagues or five of your colleagues, start playing this just within half an hour you will get 108 ideas. That's what the 635 was famous for. You, of course, you can Google it. You, you reach out to me, I'll be happy to send you slides and maybe even give a presentation on that, okay? Great, thank you. Um, so there's a, a linked question to that is, um, so what practically is the best framework to share with parents considering that teachers, teachers might be able to handle that, but parents might not? I think you're, I mean, that, that's the best question so far. Okay, so I think uh, uh, every time I talk about professional development, I actually talk about parent professional development. Right now, think about what COVID has done to us. Who are their teachers? It's the it's their parents. Right now is the first time the parents actually see what the teacher is actually teaching. So it puts us educators and teachers in a very interesting place because. The parents are involved, you know, you cannot say, hey, you cannot be in the room. In fact, there is a rule in, uh, in school districts when the child is in the classroom by themselves with the teacher, the parent has to be there. So what is happening now is the parent is also learning along with the student. So I strongly suggest to the ministries, uh, Rebecca, that's a fantastic question, a fantastic point. Please incorporate parent professional development. Even better, if you're engaging students, Ask them to bring their parent and engage the parent also along. The only challenge is everybody's busy. And parents, you know, sometimes just drop their kid in the daycare or the school and things like that. The question is, how are we going to give them an opportunity? So there are some workshops that I've done where I ask the parent and the child to come together. Otherwise, I will not run the workshop. And it was a fantastic turnaround. So uh, this is a hard question uh, to get parent, the community, not just the parents, the community involved uh, and the business involved. Great. We're coming down, we're coming close to seven, well, 7.30 for, for Washington DC time. So I'll just take about three more questions. Um, I'm going to link again two questions together. One which has is, uh, you know, how will university teacher education programs need to adapt in order to develop teachers with such a wide range of content knowledge, as well as the applicable content knowledge. And that um, connects to a second question, which I've seen, which is now how do we prepare teachers online um, and to teach online? in such a way. And that's that's really, really uh, interesting two questions. So first of all, uh, uh, as an associate dean managing close to 300 faculty members, I work with my, I'm working with some of the wonderful faculty members in my college. You know, at the end of the day, I am in the College of Science. Now there is the College of Education. There is already, you know, sometimes in many universities a divide between, wait a minute, that's a math professor. And then there is a math educator. They feel like sometimes teachers feel like, oh, uh, we should go to the College of Education. We will understand better there because they will be, they understand pedagogy. That's not really the truth, okay? Yes, they can teach pedagogy. At the same time, content knowledge is also important. And at the same time, I'm not saying they don't have content knowledge. So it's very important to bridge these two things. Otherwise, what happens is they will offer their own courses for the teachers. These colleges offer, and so the teachers don't know which ones to take. So. Uh, so to answer your first question, we have to come together and bring all these uh, silos together and create courses 
the, where the teachers will be able to experience all these different learning strategies. Your second question, I said 635. I could have done 635 today. In fact, I did 635 with five other people on Zoom. Uh, on Zoom, I can do my 635. I can share my lesson. Everybody can share your lesson and actually learn, do a professional development. In fact, we are doing it with 143 teachers in a few weeks. I'm going to be working with teachers. We just have a new grant that we just got uh, with about 11 school districts. And how do I engage all 11 school districts? I'm going to have those teachers online. They're going to do 635 exchanging lesson plans online so they get to understand. So we have to make the best of what we have. And so, yes, we are in a crisis, but let's see how we can use this to our advantage. Use the uh, poll everywhere. Use these, all these tools. I just showed you a few. And I know that you have a seminar coming up on, a webinar coming up on FET, P-H-E-T. I use that all the time. Please don't miss that. It's fantastic. P-H-E-T. And, uh, you know, uh, people with physics background, you know, they actually created as a, as a former director of the National Science Foundation at the National Science Foundation. It's, it's a product that was developed from there, you know, simulation based understanding so if you're teaching something online and you want to teach some hard concepts use these simple ideas children love video games so use those types of uh, ideas the FET is based on those types of ideas with physics principles and math principles inside so this uh, use uh, some of those structures that are existing and so obviously we need to have professional development and for the teachers on that and again when you go for a professional development, my biggest advice is please remove your teacher hat. And that's what I see is the biggest challenge. In a talk like this, I am the teacher, you are the students. Thank you. Um, let's see. I've, I'm getting quite a few questions about, let's see, here's, here's one about STEM activities are often run as challenges and competitions with one or just a few winners in the class. What's your view of collaborative versus competitive STEM activities? That's the, you saw my slide, the last slide, I said, you know, uh, don't just be competitive. Uh, there's that word right there. Don't just be competitive, but collaborative. And what do I mean by that? It's like, yes, there needs to be competition, but make teams compete rather than one person compete against 30 other people and giving them high score and low score and all that. But when teams compete, it's a whole nother thing because they talk about strategies that will help them win together. Within the teams, they come with diverse strengths. Everybody, one is a programmer, one is a this thing. And make it interesting. Make it like a shark tank. If I say the word shark tank, I hope you understand. Make them sell their answer. That's the key. And, and always, you know, in a nice way, play devil's advocate. The power of questioning. You know, the with one thing I will leave the message for the teachers do not give the answers. Ask them question and ask them question and ask them question again. One of the strategies that I, I'm going to teach on Friday, which I did not teach, is called Five Whys. So again, if you want to learn more about it, I teach a whole class on these things. Five Whys, which means you keep asking why, why, and why. And then finally, you come to what is called as a root cause solution. So uh, I would probably actually... Uh, you know, go with that questioning uh, mode for actually uh, helping make the understanding. And so the competition, even the, you will see the best of the best can still be much better than, I mean, uh, the, what I've seen many times that students, uh, that teachers say, oh, these are weak students. Immediately put those weak in, and here's a big mistake. When you're doing group projects, don't put the, what you think are the three weak students with a strong student, what you think is a strong student. What will happen is the strong student will dominate the team. Put the weak students, or what you think. I don't like to call weak students or low performing, but many teachers do. If you think that's the case, put them in a team. Put all the strong students in a team and you will see the competition immediately because they will not agree. The weak students that you think will come up with a very creative solution and they'll do much better than the, what you think are the strong students. And that is the type of, competition that you need to bring in, you know, and these are what sometimes called as hackathons and, you know, try to bring those types of ideas into the classroom and be able to deliver the subject. I think that type of collaborative nature, but still maintain that competitive level is actually very good. Great. And for the final question, um, I've seen quite a few questions about, you know, um, what if you have so not only do we have standards that need to be addressed, but also you might have overcrowded classrooms, um, just a lot of students with a lot of very specific needs, students who don't speak English, students who, um, who struggle with communication. 
And um, so I don't know, and, and also there's some, uh, some questions here about universal design and how that fits into these frameworks that you've presented. So I, I, I know that's quite broad, but I don't know yeah, if you have yeah. any final words so again, in general uh, again, about a great equity. Question. Yeah, again, a great question. I wouldn't uh, immediately recommend universal design, you know, one size fits all. No, no don't go for that. That's, uh, you know, it may look jazzy for the ministry. It may look jazzy for this thing. This is what we want to do. And this top down approach is the last thing a country should do. It should be always like a, something that is both top down and bottom up and then meet in between, you know. So, so uh, my suggestion, again, is like not to have I, all I meant is integrated approaches. I didn't mean like, uh, you know, everybody has to become master of everything. It's just trying to find the strengths that they have. And yes, I also saw another challenge is time in the classroom. So that's where the creativity is. And uh, for example, SDG, there are 17 goals. Just because there are 17 goals, your country doesn't need to implement 17 goals. You know, go inside and pick which goal you want. So you focus on uh, SDG 4, which is education, go read the targets and it'll say human rights. It'll say economics. It'll say uh, uh, entrepreneurship. Pull those competencies out. Enter that into your standards. And this is exactly, by the way, once again, I'm taking Suriname. The minister is really thinking outside the box. And so she wants to put this in a third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth grade classroom. Imagine fourth graders being entrepreneurs. So how would you write a curriculum for that? And that's where a competency based education is very, very important. So not just, uh, you know, just subjects, integrating the subjects with a competency framework. And that will take time, but it's doable. Excellent. Thank you so much, Dr. Paju. I'm going to go ahead and share my final slide, um, if that's okay. Yes. Uh, so okay. I'm going to stop sharing. Thank, Thank you. you all. <laughs> Thank you. One moment. And um, as we close down tonight, um, as I mentioned before, there will be a final survey that will be going online. And so I ask you to, um, just one moment here. So um, please, when you do get punted over to that website, um, I do hope that um, you will go ahead and take that for us. Oops, I'm having a hard time finding, a, finding my share button here. There we go. Excellent. Okay. So um, what I'm sharing right here is just our, uh, um, our, our website. Um, if you are interested in attending any additional webinars, please do visit www.oas.org slash en slash iten. Um, also, a number of you have asked, within 24 hours, you will receive an email stating that you attended and certifying you for 1.5 hours. Whether or not your ministry or your school district accepts that is ultimately up to them, but it will state that you were in attendance for approximately 1.5 hours for this particular webinar. Um, we will have the video recording of this session as well as Dr. Padu's slides. And Dr. Padu has shared a number of times his email address and ways that you can contact him. And I saw many questions specific about um, uh, some additional information on the topics that he presented wanting to know where he is on Friday, and if you can also, <laughs> if he's live streaming his lessons on Friday, um, I encourage you to reach out to him directly. Um, and uh, I want to thank everybody for attending. Um, I also want to thank the portal, the, edu the uh, Portal Educativo de las Americas that is live streaming this on their Facebook page, and of course to our donor, the U.S. Mission. Um, so thank you so much, Dr. Padu. We always appreciate having your expertise and I think your inspiration. Um, I do see that energy. And thank you to the OAS. I mean, I, I, thank you to you guys. And I've been involved with some of the you know, countries that I'm learning so much from. You know, and uh, and uh, for the audience, you should definitely look at some of the interesting projects that they have. Uh, I'm assuming they all know about these programs. So I think the it's, uh, you, guys, you guys run some wonderful programs. So. Great. Well, thank you. We're so happy that you're able to be part of it. All right. Well, um, with that, we'll close tonight's session. And uh, thank you. Have a wonderful evening. And please stay healthy. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.